Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Excel International PLC Annual Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll, and if you would give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. It gives me great pleasure to hand over to CEO Stephen Newton. Good afternoon. Hi there. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for taking the time to listen to our presentation today. Hopefully, this will be some good news for all of you who are holders, and for those of you who aren't holders, hopefully we'll encourage you to become one. Um, we've obviously had a very, very good year with strong revenue growth and profit. Um, We've continued to develop our four pillar growth strategy, which I'll go into a little bit de detail later, um, which has delivered some great results for us. And that all four of those pillars are working very nicely together. So that's um, really the, the, the emphasis for today is to say, look, we've had, we've had a fantastic year. Um, and uh, we also expect that to continue into 2023, um, which I'll tell you a little bit about, about towards the end of the presentation. Or uh, in fact, I touch on it a little bit later here too. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so um, here's the um, what has happened to us since we IPO'd in um, March of 2020. Um, that was in the middle of a pandemic. We've had 53% revenue CAGR since we IPO'd. Um, we've had 122% US revenue CAGR since we IPO'd, which is very, very important because the US market is twice the size in consulting terms uh, than the, uh, the European market. So um, it a, represents a very important part of our strategy to be a um, global consulting firm, uh, positioning itself as the challenger consultancy. We, we definitely need to be uh, very, very strong in the U.S. So it's, it's great to see that, that U.S. growth. We've done three acquisitions that uh, Graham will tell you about um, a little bit later. Um, we've done eight earnings upgrades since IPO, which we're very proud of. And um, we've had a, a, a large increase in the number of clients uh, since IPO with 200 active clients. So that should give you some sense of the, the level of diversification of our revenue lines just, just there. We've got a, had a 135% share price increase since IPO, listing at £2.17. I haven't seen it as of late, but it was just over £5 again today. Um, candidly, we're a little bit disappointed with that. If you look at the EV EBITDA multiplier, um, it's 8.1 times. Uh, we believe we're pretty undervalued relative to um, even at our IPO, we were 10 times. So um, we think we're pretty undervalued at this point. Um, and hopefully the, these results will do some encourage the, the right sort of um, EV multiplier uh, to return. The one point I haven't touched on this slide is this estimated dilution. A few shareholders have um, commented that our remuneration structure which is highly incentivizing our people around equity, um, creates a dilution for uh, investors. Um, I'm still the largest shareholder in the company, so I'm very careful about diluting. Uh, we'd only dilute if we think we're adding value. And in this case, Nick will take you through a model that uh, shows you how this has been calculated. But um, if we produce a billion dollar market cap company, or sorry, billion pound market cap company in six years, we'll get a four times enterprise value multiplier um, from where we are today um, with a 2020, sorry, a 22% uh, estimated reduction, uh, dilution to the, to the shareholder pool. So as a, as a shareholder, I'll definitely take that all day long. And as you'll see, when we describe this to you in more detail, um, it's, uh, people are only gonna be earning those options um, and, and equity positions if, the company grows at a, a CAGR of around 25%. And as you can see, our group CAGR since IPO has been 53%. So um, revenue CAGR at least. Um, so assuming we can keep the profitability and that we our EV EBITDA multiplier remains constant, then you know we can see a, a market cap growing in linear step with revenue. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't been the case of late, but uh, that's probably because of general market conditions. Let me give you some highlights of... Um, uh, financial year 2022 and I'll touch on very briefly on the forward look which I'll go into a little bit more detail later on clearly we've had a wonderful um, uh, year this year we've got 40 percent uh, revenue growth underlying organic growth is 18 percent 
The rest is, uh, as you can see, from an acquisition of ILAP, which is a data technology and analytics consultancy. Um, this was a very strategic buy for us in around March, April time. Um, and, uh, as, and Graham will take you through some of the, um, uh, the value we, we're getting from that business already. But suffice to say, there's a lot of cross synergies between our businesses. And I will also talk a, a little bit about this when uh, I talk about how our revenue per partner is increasing. And uh, the reason that's happening is we're providing more, we're providing more services to our partners to take to their customers, and where they have very good relationships, that obviously leads to um, more revenue for partners. So that's very good. Clearly, we love getting awards and accolades. There's, we 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 do a lot of that, um, and also, as I've mentioned, we've got 200 plus clients right now. And what's most pleasing about this is there's a 21 percent increase in our gold accounts. And again, um, a little bit later, Caroline will talk to you about our portfolio of clients and, and the, the sort of portfolio risk, if you like, in relation to our clients. And we've done a lot of work in terms of improving that. Um, and obviously, uh, I've mentioned revenue per partner. I'll go into a little bit more detail of this, but we've seen an increase in revenue per partner primarily because we have this opportunity to, to sell other services beyond just our core consulting services. And looking forward, um, we're looking very optimistically at financial year 23. Um, I've just finished an, uh, uh, last week. We had a two-day partner offsite where we go through each partner goes through line by line their, their sales pipeline, their, their, their project pipeline, and um, as a result of that, we we're able to increase guidance. It was 85 to 87. We think it's more likely to be 85 to 90, um, and obviously maintaining our excellent EBITDA margin of 28 to 30 percent in that range. Um, one last thing I'd point I'd like to make on this chart is. Um, you know, I've been running this business with Graham since 2009. Um, we have a very experienced management team, and I'll, I'll talk you through that a little bit later, um, that are very familiar with scaling consulting businesses like this. Um, and clearly, I've had myself had um, three tours of duty in, in, in sort of the top 10 consulting, uh, 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 consulting businesses, let's say. Um, I've done a tour of duty in three of them of about five years each. So I have a lot of respect for those businesses, but we're obviously trying to challenge them and uh, and and uh, take them down a peg or two, let's say. Um, so that that is uh, the CEO highlights. I'll hand to Graham, who will briefly introduce himself and then take you through the financial highlights. Thank you, Steve. And hello, everyone. Graham Busby. I'm co-founder, as Steve mentioned, uh, and the CFO. And I also look after our inorganic strategy <clears throat> so I can talk to you about how uh, I and we think about acquisitions. But uh, just starting off with the numbers, uh, the financial highlights of 2022. So from a revenue perspective, revenue is up 40% from 50.6 million pounds to 70.7. Uh, our partners are performing very well within this. Um, the revenue per client facing partner has, has increased again this year. And Steve's going to talk uh, a bit more about that shortly. Uh, the underlying organic revenue increased by 18%. Uh, the rest of the growth, uh, the rest of that 40% is through inorganic and was through the uh, acquisition of ILAP, which we did in March uh, last year. And we're very pleased with how that uh, has fitted into the business and the work that we're doing. And, and again, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Our pipeline is strong. Uh, we've currently contracted a healthy percentage of 2023's budget uh, versus where we are in the year. Uh, and uh, as Steve mentioned, we've upgraded the revenue guidance today uh, and uh, are very confident uh, about that. Uh, we've just spent three days together as a board and partnership uh, team last week, and that gave us the confidence behind those numbers. We've just had three record months in a row, uh, which obviously equals a record quarter, so we've had a great start to the year. Going into gross profit, um, we delivered 23.2 million pounds, which is 31% up on 2021. Uh, the actual GP percentage was slightly down on 21 as travel and business development activities returned to normal uh, following COVID. Uh, but we do continue to be meticulous over the pricing and management of projects, especially utilization to ensure that our profits remain at those levels. Adjusted EBITDA, uh, we delivered 20.5 million pounds uh, for the 2022 year at a 29% margin. Uh, this was a 30% increase from the year before. 
If you've looked at the annual reports this morning uh, or this afternoon, uh, you'll see there were roughly £3.6 million of adjustments between adjusted EBITDA and operating profit. Um, just to quickly step through those, roughly £1 million uh, was depreciation, uh, of, of, of which most is the real cash cost of the capitalised officers. Roughly £2 million is amortisation of intangible assets, uh, which is an increase from last year because of the ILAP acquisition. This is a combination of train box, uh, customer relationships and customer order book, which is non-cash and will decrease over time. There's a £600,000 credit uh, uh, for M&A related items. Uh, that's made up of an £800,000 debit for ILAP, uh, offset by £1.4 million credit uh, for the waiving of the return deferred consideration, given a restructure that we did, which uh, Steve will touch on shortly. The remainder is £1.16 million of share-based payments, uh, and this is the internal partner and employee uh, options, plus the ILAP options from the deals. Clearly, this is non-cash item and, and is at a similar level to last year. So that flows through to bottom left, profit before tax, £15.7 million, which was a 29% rise. Uh, looking at EPS, so adjusted diluted EPS of 30.5 pence, this is an increase of 26% to 2021 and reflects a 12% effective dilution for the impact of uh, unvested options, our employee share purchase uh, plan and the ILAP deferred consideration. Um, Nick's going to cover a longer term forecast for the impact of dilution uh, in quite some detail a bit later as well, which hopefully you'll uh, give you good insight on that. And given such a strong year in terms of cash generation, uh, with uh, 14.6 million pounds, a 7% increase, uh, we're also pleased to announce a dividend payment of 10.8 pence per share, which is a 163% increase from the prior year. And this uh, this is planned to be paid in August uh, after approval at our AGM. If we step through now to financial performance, I just wanted to give you an idea of uh, track record for those who haven't seen it. So. Um, first of all, you know, there are four ways to grow a business, uh, which are our four pillars to our strategy, um, which Steve will step through uh, just now. Uh, they are stretching our existing partners, uh, i.e. getting them to uh, sell and do more. They're promoting partners from within the firm, from principal to partner. Hiring new partners, uh, so partners with black books and clients who can bring them into the firm. And then what I'm looking at, which is acquiring businesses uh, and obviously bringing them into the group. Um, if you look at the chart in the bottom right, you can see we've had strong growth. We've had 39% revenue CAGR over the period shown here. That's against a market that's grown at 8% CAGR over that period. So uh, clearly the difference of that is that we've been gaining market share uh, in every year. And you can see that the uh, EBITDA has, has risen uh, very nicely along with the revenue as we've kept our EBITDA percentages uh, in the high 20s and 30s, uh, low 30s as well. So very good performance, and uh, like I said, we're confident that this will keep going outwards into 23 and beyond. Um, I'm going to hand back to Steve now uh, to talk through a couple of different views of our own revenue um, and the difference between 2021 and 2022. Uh, hopefully this will give a bit of transparency of how management make decisions and the impact that that has on the performance of the business. Back to you. Yeah, thanks, Graham. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, yeah, so what we try to do here is to give you some transparency as to the puts and takes, if you like, in, in our revenue growth model. What you can see here um, is 2021's revenue, 50.6 million, and obviously what we've, we've uh, announced today, 70.7 million, and then the, the puts and takes between that. The first thing that you can see there is a return restructure. This was an acquisition we did back in 2021. Um, we, we did three things with this business. Uh, we changed the leadership. We felt that uh, there were a few things that we needed to improve on running this, this business. So we've, we've changed the leadership. Um, we've improved the propositions by merging the procurement proposition with the, the strategic sourcing proposition that we already had in Elixir. And, and that has um, improved that business immeasurably. immeasurably. But what we also did was um, we exited certain contracts and certain client relationships where we were frankly unhappy with the profitability of those relationships. So um, all of those things were uh, decisions made by, by, by leadership being, uh, uh, I guess, me. Um, and that was deliberately in line with the uh, strategy that we are trying to get uh, release more profitable uh, clients with not as much profitability, if you like, and also improve the performance of our 
uh, acquired businesses. So that business is now flying. It's doing fantastically well. Um, we've also done a very similar thing with uh, Elixir Digital, not quite the same. What we had, um, we had a pre-IPO acquisition called Den, which was, uh, Graham will tell you a little bit more about that, and um, another business called Coast. What we've done is we've brought those two businesses together. So now we have an integra integrated Elixir Digital proposition, and we've appointed uh, a single leader of that business. And also we've exited some uh, marginal profit clients that we didn't feel were um, of the ilk that we wanted to be continuing with. Then we had some um, so unforeseen events, things like uh, an acquisition by um, a, a, another a client being acquired by another business, for example. There was a large bank, for example, in the US, um, sorry, a mid-sized bank that got acquired by another mid-sized bank. It was market consolidation exercise. And usually what happens in those situations is the, the acquired uh, business uh, doesn't get to choose their, their preferred consulting relationship. So we unfortunately lose, sometimes lose business that way. Then you'll see a, um, a 11.6 million reduction of end of life projects. This is normal behavior, although I would say this 11.6 million is unusually large in this year because we had uh, one un unusually large project that we were working on come to an end in the early parts of the year. If we, interestingly, if we had had um, ILAP at that time, we would have probably been able to continue with this. It was far more technical and data driven for the second or third phases of this project. And we actually lost this business to another, another um, uh, uh, organization that had the ILAP type of skill. Now, if we'd had that business, if ILAP had been with us at that time, we would have probably had a better chance of keeping this business. If you take that unusual event out, our actual organic growth is around 29%. But if you add that back in, it's around 18%. So we we feel very good about our base organic growth. Um, obviously, we, we face some of these negative, um, well, not negative, but um, uh, downward pressures on revenue too, let's put it that way. So hopefully that gives you a good understanding. Obviously, there's an acquisition that, that obviously comes in, which adds another um, uh, 15 or so million to the, to the um, position we have there. This is a, a, another version of the same truth. Um, and I think we had a question here about partner remuneration, which I'll, I'll, I'll touch on a little bit later. I thought it was about revenue, but um, this is about partner revenue per partner. Okay, so um, Graham mentioned we have a four pillar growth strategy and we cover all four of those pillars here. And you might say, well, there's five blocks here building up between the two. Well, that's true because it's not a growth strategy, but we do exit partners. and. Um, you know, uh, what I want to point out here is obviously we exit partners who do not meet our performance bar. So uh, an average of 1.53 million um, revenue attainment is not good enough for a, an Elixir partner. So, you know, we, we, we have to take those decisions to exit. Um, and uh, as a high performing culture, we, we have to do both sides. We reward performance, but we also um, uh, take action on underperformance. And this is what we, we, we had to do here. Um, what is really nice overall, though, is if you look at revenue per partner in, uh, sorry, in the 2020, 2021 year, is that 2022, 2021, sorry, 2021 year is 50.6 and average revenue per partner is 3.15. Obviously, it's, uh, it's gone up nicely to 3.57 per partner at 70.7 .7 million. The positive actions to the partner um, average, you can see after the exited position, established partners are contributing for just over 4 million per partner, which is really nice because what that means is they're being able to sell um, the, the wider services that we have now with things like uh, the digital propositions and our data and analytics capability. Clearly, we've made some promotions, which uh, um, and the promoter partners bring in uh, or look after revenue for us, so that's uh, very important. And probably our most valued way of, of um, bringing partners through the firm. And then uh, obviously we've made some hires. You, you, the, the average revenue per hire here is fairly low because they happen, they happen towards the back end of the year. So they're still getting up to speed and we should see, they've all landed very well actually, in fact. And um, uh, you should see those numbers going up. And then clearly our acquisitions um, add to the situation here. And uh, that gives us the, the growth in revenue per partner overall. So all in the 13% from 3.15 to 
five seven um, is made up in that way um, through those four le four levers and plus obviously the negative effect of exits. I'm now going to hand over to um, Nick, who's going to talk you through a similar view for cash. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Nick Willock, I'm Finance Director and Company Secretary. So from a cash perspective, our business model has continued to perform very strongly. We, we continue to see high conversion of our EBITDA list corporation tax to operating cash flow. So operating cash flow in the year was £15.7 million, an increase of 1.4 million or 7% on FY21. This was slightly less than the proportionate increase in EBITDA as a result of having less creditors at year end, about a million pounds less like for like, and paying higher cash tax in the year, uh, 1.3 million higher, as most of our subsidiary companies now are, are now large enough to pay tax on a quarterly basis rather than paying annually in arrears as they did in previous years. We spent 19.4 million pounds on acquisitions. Most of this was for the acquisition of ILAP, plus a small amount of deferred consideration for the acquisition of Coast. We satisfied all of the ILAP initial consideration from cash, um, rather than uh, issuing shares for to the sellers of sellers of ILAP. We get paid the consideration all in cash, and they purchased shares from our EBT. And this is a mechanism we are we are using to ensure that we can complete acquisitions with minimal or no dilution to shareholders. And in this case, there was no dilution um, at, at all for the acquisition of ILAP. There was a net EBT transactions and EBT and shareholder loan transactions of cash outflow of 4.9 million pounds. Most of this was the purchase of shares for our EBT and our balance of, balance of shares held in our EBT increased from 2 million at uh, December 21 to 7 million pounds at December 22. So you can think of those shares really as being equivalent to cash as we can use them for acquisition. And in fact, we used most of that balance of shares to settle 50% of the ILAP deferred consideration in early FY23. Again, without any dilution of shareholders because we paid cash and that cash came back to the company through the purchase of shares from UBT by, by the uh, former shareholders of ILAP. We closed FY22 with 20.4 million pounds of cash and, and no debt. So again, a very strong financial position giving us plenty of cash resources for both our increased dividend of £5 million that we'll be paying in August, and also to cover potential future acquisitions. If I now move on to the balance sheet, net assets increased for, by £10 million from £86 million in December 21 to £96 million in December, December 22. If I just pull out the, the major changes on the balance sheet, intangible assets increased by £27 million, this is the goodwill and customer intangible assets re recognized on the acquisition of ILAP, net of a two million pound charge for the amortization of customer intangibles. Trade and other receivables increased by 4.2 million pounds. This was a combination of revenue growth. The December 22 was about 50% higher in revenue than December 21, and a couple of clients paying us in the first week or two of January rather than the last week of December. But we have no issues with our debtors. We have a blue chip client base. We monitor our debtors every week and have no issues from a, a recoverability perspective. We've been through the moving in cash on the previous slide, uh, and trade and other liabilities increased by 11.7 million pounds. This is the accrual of the ILAP, ILAP's deferred consideration, where we accrued the maximum on acquisition because we expected strong performance from that business. In fact, we saw that in FY22, where they achieved their earnout. If I now move on to the next slide, uh, which is our dilution model. So we've had some questions from shareholders around dilution. Clearly, the equity incentives that we give to our employee team are, are, are very important in motivating that team and aligning them with external shareholders. And we've always been very comfortable that this, um, that this structure creates far more value than it does in terms of di than the, the value of costs to existing shareholders in terms of dilution. And we want to set out for you our assumptions on this just to, to make, it, make it very clear. So we've modelled 25% organic growth in the business, compounding, um, maintaining our EBITDA margin of 20, 29%, which is where we closed last year, which we believe is sustainable. Some modest increase in multiple to 13 times EBITDA multiple in the latter years, and that gets us to a billion pound unicorn in six years by 2028. We then modelled all of the existing option pool that the current partner team and employee team have, 
and the options that we would grant to future employees, both new partners, um, four in the short, in the near years, growing to 13 partners per year in the outer years, and, and new employees as we grow the business and the employee base by 25% per year in line with revenue. And then if you model the impact of those options for the ones that exist today and the options being granted to new employees, you're assuming 65% vesting, and it's important that all of our um, options, none of our, our options do not vest unless you perform. So 65% is the historic average, and we, we, which we've modeled, and a very conservative 10% attrition rate, because although we have very good attrition rates for, for our industry, um, our un unmanaged attrition is, is actually higher than that. So it's fairly conservative assumptions. This gets us to a 22% dilution in six years. So four times the enterprise value, the 22% dilution. And that's because both because employees have to perform to get their options, and our options are all granted at market price. So these are not nil cost options that some companies use. The, the, the employee or partner only gets the benefit of growth in the share price because the option is part of the market price. And that limits dilution, but also completely aligns their incentives with those of our external shareholders. So, so we think this is a very compelling argument for the way we've structured our, our employee incentive schemes. Now I'll hand back to Ed over to Caroline. She's going to talk about business developments. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit more about how we've actually been able to maintain these exceptional uh, levels of growth and, and profitability as well. Um, so the profitability side really comes down to the approach that we take with clients. We position ourselves as the MBBs, and that's actually how our clients rate us as well. In an external survey um, we did a couple of years back, um, our clients actually named us to be um, most related to the likes of McKinsey, Bain and Boston um, in the consulting market. So we're positioned very much at the strategy boardroom level, which means that we have relationships with the C-suite executives. Um, and it also means that we maintain those relationships throughout you know, growth markets and potentially difficult markets as well. We're able to address multiple challenges, um, now even more so through our acquisitions. So where you know, typically before we were very much at the strategy level, we're now able to execute on that strategy as well, which is highly valuable for clients. So with the likes of ILAP, our digital businesses, and also the procurement expertise of return, we're now offered to, able to offer both ends of that spectrum. Um, and that's only scaling our, our clients, adding to the longevity of our, our projects, um, and obviously then creating the growth that, that you're seeing today. We, we obviously focus massively on retaining clients. Um, so we've got 72% repeat clients for 2022, which, which is clearly really, really strong. As Steve mentioned earlier, we're focused on scaling those accounts as well. So we saw a 21% increase in our gold clients, which are accounts worth £1 million and above. Um, and also obviously bringing in new logos as well. So those three things are all um, helping to obviously sustain the growth that we've been seeing. And we expect, expect that to going forward as well. As Nick touched on, um, the reason that we're able to operate in this way and add the value to clients is very much our people. You know, we're hiring from top universities. We've got an array of skill sets now in the business from strategy consultants through to designers and digital engineers and also with the data expertise that ILAP brought in, uh, in March. And as I said before, all of this is adding to the value that we can actually ultimately deliver to clients at the end of the day, which is making all of these pillars work really well and it's helping to retain the clients and, and bring in new clients as well. Looking a little bit more closely at 2022, on the left-hand side there, you can see our top 10 clients. And really, this is showcasing not only do we have low levels of client concentration, and that's been improving year on year since our IPO, um, for example, at IPO, our number one client contributed 25% um, of the business, and now it's only 8% or just under 8% for 2022. So that's improving every single year. But the other important point on this slide is if you look on the left-hand column and also uh, the third column as well, you can see we're working in, in an array of industries, an array of geographies as well. So we're very, very diversified in the market, which is making us exceptionally resilient, uh, particularly to the current market conditions. You know, we're not reliant on one industry and we have multiple capabilities to offer to clients so that we can, you know, we can increase those certain capabilities, maybe in downward trending markets and increase other capabilities when clients are after maybe more innovation and growth as well. So this is making us exceptionally resilient. And again, why you're seeing the performance that you're seeing today. Just looking a little bit more at our teams that I mentioned earlier, we have a team of around 500 employees. 
Some of these are based, um, well, they're all based across the globe. We have team locations, but based on the fact that we operate under one PNL, we're able to place people on the right project. We're very, very flexible with that approach. And it means that we, our clients are getting the best value from our people as well, um, which makes it incredibly, you know, increase our ability to scale, which is, which is fantastic. On the right-hand side, as Nick, Nick mentioned, uh, we offer all of our employees, no matter what their role, no matter where they're based, they're all offered equity, but they have to perform to get that equity. So you can see on the, on the right-hand side, the 64%, those, those are the people that performed and that they actually got their options for 2022. So we're very fastidious on actually handing out those options. People know that there's a very high bar that they continually have to meet. And that's crucial as we scale, obviously, to retain that quality and to retain our market positioning, um, which is why we're able to, again, hold those levels of profitability. So I'm going to hand over to Graeme now to talk a little bit more about each of our acquisitions to date and, and how they've landed. Thank you, Caroline. So we have done four acquisitions to date. Uh, one of them was pre-IPO in 2017, which is DEN, as you can see on the left there. And then we've done uh, one each year since then with Coast Return and ILAP. I think it's important to say that every acquisition acquisition we do is earnings enhancing. Uh, you can see on the middle row there uh, how EBITDA has increased uh, quite rapidly. And for us, it's about market integration. It's about getting each other into each other's clients uh, and making one plus one equals three. Uh, it's not about back office uh, synergies or integration, uh, which is probably more the private equity model. We actually want to uh, do different things with our clients, uh, new things, and be able to give them the value for that. And, and in return, uh, we get um, you know new clients asking us uh, for the latest and greatest. Um, to show you uh, Den, they are a creative and digital agency, uh, and then Coast are at the other end of the spectrum, digital marketing. Uh, together, we uh, treat them as a kind of a digital uh, capability, if you like, uh, as Elixir Digital. And I'll give you a couple of examples uh, as to how we've gone to market together there. Uh, return, focus on procurement, transformation, supply chain, and cost. And in a um, bearish market, obviously, that has come into its own recently. And then ILAP last year, which was our, our biggest acquisition to date in the US, uh, that is data and technology. And again, we've shown great success uh, amongst our client set uh, working together there. Just to give you a couple of examples, um, starting with Elixir Digital, so Den and Coast. Um, one uh, UK insurance company we were working with, with, with a consulting hat on, if you like, was a relatively uh, you know, good, good sized project. We were doing a sprint with them, uh, but then that evolved into actually designing and building the, um, the outcomes of that sprint. And it actually turned into a £1 million plus client. On the uh, EDX side, the Elixir Digital side, they had a client uh, which was a UK national standards body where they were doing some uh, digital marketing with them, uh, things like uh, pay-per-click and, and search engine optimization. Again, relatively small to start with, uh, but then they brought in the consulting team and we actually transformed their full digital experience. And that, again, became a multi-million pound client. So really good synergies between the two. Looking at return, um, you know, one consulting client we had was a Jersey subsidiary of a national bank, uh, one that everyone here would have heard of. Uh, and we did a small piece of work with them around business continuity planning. Uh, but then uh, we brought in return alongside us to then look at a load of their big third party contracts, which, which uh, gave us a, a, a several months worth of work. Uh, on the flip of that, uh, Return had a UK media company where they were looking at third-party spend again, but more with a tactical lens. And then they brought in the consulting team to look at the operating model uh, with a far more strategic view. And together, we, we saved them more than £20 million. Pounds. Likewise, doing the same with ILAP, um, uh, we had a, or we have a, an African bank that we've worked with for many years, and we've worked all the way across the bank, never in data. And with ILAP joining Elixir, we were able to uh, help them with their data strategy and then actually execute uh, the roadmap out the back of it. And on the flip side of that one, um, ILAP uh, worked with a US regional bank uh, and still worked with them and brought in Elixir to, to really talk to the board and, and to the leadership team about their overall strategy, not just data. Uh, and that helped us both uh, get into new parts of the bank together. 
So, you know, big joint projects that we're working together on uh, and it, it's really proving out the strategy very nicely. Thinking about going forward, if we go to the next page in terms of growth prospects, uh, you can see on the left there some of the pipeline figures that we have. I've got a dedicated team uh, working on this with me. Uh, and since IPO, we've screened over 3,000 um, uh, boutique consultancies. I've personally engaged with nearly 400 of them uh, and uh, had introductory meetings with 130. And you can see how those uh, numbers flow through the pipeline. You can see that we've got to, to due diligence with eight and we've done four deals in total, three since IPO. Uh, I think importantly, the difference between those two is that we could have done eight, uh, but we pull out of due diligence if we don't like what we see and it doesn't align to what we are as a business. Um, what does that mean? Well, some of the things we look at on the right-hand side there, uh, and, and I touched on this in our last presentation, so uh, if you did hear it, then I'll, you would have heard some of it, but hopefully those who haven't heard it will be useful to know. Uh, we have a programmatic way of looking at acquisitions. So what that means is looking at uh, one or two deals a year where together it makes up 20 to 30% of our market cap. So that's different to doing multiple small deals, and it's different to doing one massive deal. And it's actually proven out to be the best performing M&A strategy uh, when looking across the most uh, successfully acquisitive companies around the world. And for us, that's been underpinning uh, strategy to date, and, and, it, and it will do uh, as well going forward. What we look at is, uh, from a capability point of view, is board, boardroom issues. So we want the best boutique um, businesses who deal with uh, boardroom issues uh, that either we do part of or that we don't do yet at all. So, for example, one that we might do part of is data with ILAP. That, that ticks a, uh, a big uh, tick across the data spectrum, but there are elements that ILAP don't work in and we would look, love to add to um, their overall capability, either through bringing them in to do that piece or even there could be a geography angle um, that the data um, behind it makes sense to do. Um, other, other areas to look at could be uh, competitive intelligence, uh, you know, digital we've looked at, innovation, ESG, cybersecurity. These are the types of issues that the majority of our clients are, are grappling with day to day. And you know, the strategy is to get the best of the best boutiques in each of those boxes and then stitch them together and work together to create the most shareholder value, uh, but importantly, actually, the most client value um, uh, so that we, we get those long-term uh, large clients uh, for, for, for years going forward. The service uh, quality needs to be excellent, quite frankly. Um, that's what is behind our brand and has been since day one. Uh, we have pulled out of due diligence amongst uh, some of the companies we've met with because the quality of, of the work hasn't been there. Uh, but, you know, obviously also quality of uh, earnings. We've shown you how strong our, our P&L and balance sheet are and what we don't want to do is, is erode that if we don't see sight of kind of bringing them up to the levels we're in. I mentioned geography from a data perspective, but it can be, uh, it can get us into um, uh, new geographies or it can actually um, go behind investments we've already made. US is a big investment geography for us. We've, we've made no secrets of that fact. It's a large part of our revenue for last year. And we're actively uh, looking at further US acquisitions uh, likewise, UK and EU uh, and South Africa is where the rest, most of the rest of our revenue is. And, you know, it, it will make sense to make acquisitions in those areas as well. You know, one thing we don't do as a consultancy business is invest in a um, geography first and kind of cross your fingers and, and hope that clients are going to follow. Uh, we've always gone there through client demand. But another way we can go into a new geography is through an acquisition where there are clients, there are people and the demand is there already. And that's, uh, that's a key part as well. And then finally, uh, aligning the deal structures, uh, the way that we structure the deals is based on uh, an EBITDA valuation. So uh, getting an adjusted EBITDA number, um, agreeing what multiple should be applied to that based on historical growth rates, client concentration, um, you know, quality of earnings, et cetera. Uh, and then getting to a consideration number, which we then look to divide a third, a third, a third. So a third cash, uh, a third Elixir shares day one to get them, uh, you know, hopefully major shareholders are coming in and, and therefore highly aligned to our partner team. And then they can earn the final third by achieving targets over the next three years uh, post deal. So what's nice uh, about all of that is it really does align to the, our, our whole partner team. 
and is very much part of the entrepreneurial nature that's given us the success today. So with that, I'll hand back to Steve to give you a view of uh, the outlook going forward. Thank you, Graham. <clears throat> yeah, the first thing I'd, I'd like to look at is um, when looking at the summary and outlook, I just want to touch on the quality of the team uh, that leads this company. Um, I'll just focus your 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 eyes on the the middle uh, row, if you like, there for a second. Um, these are this is essentially my leadership team. Um, Claire Fulby, I've known for years and years, but um, she used to be a the CEO of Accenture, and she's now our CEO, and she's been with Elixir for nine years. So Claire's, Claire really understands our business, and she also knows how to scale consulting businesses because she was a strategic leader uh, in the Accenture organization as it scaled here in the UK. Um, and everybody can look to see how, how that business has seriously scaled and delivered value to its shareholders. Um, Graham, I won't touch on, he's in the room, he's my co-founder, um, but Brandon is another name I should pick out here. He's also been with us for nine years or so, now, eight years or, uh, or so now, um, and he basically runs my, our sales and marketing activity, and he's done a fantastic job since IPOs, as, as you can tell, from the 30 million that we, 30, roughly 30 million we IPO'd with, to the 70 odd million that we, um, we're we trading at now. He's done a super job. His background is PwC Infosys. He was one of the first uh, people to join Infosys when they were trying to build a, a consulting business. And in five years, they built it to 5,000 people globally. So that's a pretty good uh, track record in terms of scaling a consulting business from nothing. Ian Ferguson is my co-founder. Um, Ian was a Magic Circle law firm for 30 years. He was with Alan and Overy. He was the partner leading there. Corporate, uh, corporate law practice. Um, so we pretty much have probably one of the city's best lawyers as, as our general counsel. And so we, we, we pretty watertight in the legal space. Um, and Eric Rich is another name I should point out. Um, he was, uh, he's also been with us for quite some years now, seven years, uh, in Elixir. And he was actually appointed into emphasis and ran the, the emphasis business. Um, when Brandon was there at the same time and ended up running it for five or so years after that, after after Brandon left, and um, also had PwC in his background. And Nick, who you will have um, heard from earlier, Nick is used to be a client of ours, actually was an FD of one of our clients and liked the business so much he joined us. So uh, thanks for doing that, Nick. And then Caroline has been with the firm five years. So it's a fantastic leadership team. And... Um, I'm, I'm very proud to say that this team is very, very capable and, and obviously very um, able to scale businesses like this and have been there and done that and worn the T-shirt a few times, let's say, in, in doing that. I also want to touch on the rest of the partner team just quickly. There's been a few questions here about um, uh, attracting partners and um, uh, incentivize, in, the incentivization model for partners. So I'll just pick that up on this, on this chart here. Um, all of these people uh, below the, the, the cent central line there can actually go into the marketplace and earn a, a partnership uh, uh, income out of one of, say, the big the big top 10 firms. And just quickly about that industry, I had a question here about the industry and how you see, see ourselves. I'll just quickly touch on that as well. The industry is basically broken down into two halves, if you like. The first half is the top 10 consulting firms account for about 50% of the global consulting spend out there and the top 10 firms are the usual suspects, McKinsey, Bain, Boston, KPMG, Accenture, IBM, PwC, and if I've forgotten one, I've forgotten one or two. It doesn't really matter. You, I think you know the, the, the names in there, they're almost household names. The bottom 50% of the market or the other 50% of the consulting market is accounted for by, by about 100,000 boutique consulting firms. And, and the difference between these two groups of um, uh, consultants is actually quite stark. The, the, the boutique firms have to be far more scrappy, far more entrepreneurial and actually better in certain instances than the big 10 firms because they, otherwise they wouldn't win the business. They don't have the brand power. So you often find in those boutique firms a, a very competitive, a very um, capable and very um, skilled set of individuals. And these are the sorts of people I'm looking to attract to Elixir with the equity incentive model. And that's the big difference with um, a person sitting in a top 10 firm. They largely, there's one or two exceptions in the top, top 10. There's only three listed firms in that top 10 group. The rest are all partnerships. So they're turning up for in-year cash remuneration. 
and they're not turning up for a five-year equity story. Whereas most people who start companies, aka the boutique consulting firms as an example, all starting those companies to create equity value for the long term. That's how they, they, they see themselves generating the, the, the wealth they'd like to generate. This is true for 90% of the, uh, well, all of the people on this page, for example. Um, but just to give you a sense of what that looks like, any one of these people can go and get an average partner salary pay. And I use the one that's got the lowest average pay. By the way, you can get this information of Companies House website, KPMG, PwC, Deloitte, all the, all the LLPs that are, are, are um, uh, registered in the UK have to publish their uh, accounts on Companies House. They have to show their average partner pay and they have to show their CEO pay. So the average partner pay for a, the lowest one is KPMG at, at about a million pounds. So each partner in KPMG on the average would be getting a million pounds. What's the maximum my partners can get? 360, 300, yeah, 360,000 pounds is the maximum they can get. And that's if they hit all of their targets. They don't, that's not average. That's your top of the house. You get, you get your 360,000 pounds. So all of these people could go and get 700, give or take 700, uh, 640,000 pounds more at, um, at, at a KPMG, which is the lowest paying of all the partnerships. Okay. What do they get for that? They get shares in our firm. They get options, market price options, which is what Nick was talking about, so that they get the growth in the share price. They don't get an existing grant, if you like. They get a three million pound um, option at market price. Why? Because over five years, that's what they've given up with KPMG. Let's say in KPMG, they'd get, make five million over five years if they were on the average. So they're getting with us 1.8 million. They're giving up 3.2 million. We give them a three three million pound option at market price. If they double the firm, they get three million pounds. If they triple the firm with with us, they get six million pounds. So the motivation for them is very aligned with growing the business and the equity value of this company. Um, they can outperform a, an opportunity in KPMG over five years if we get this company to a billion dollars. The opportunity for them is somewhere between nine and twelve million when you add it all together as opposed to, say, a $5 million opportunity in, in KPMG. But they have to sacrifice before they do that. They have to sacrifice the fact that they could go and get the million in cash as opposed to the £360,000 that they get from us at a maximum. Okay, So they have to be in that mindset. So what you're seeing here is a group of people who are very entrepreneurial, people who are very hungry and very aligned with the interests of any investor community that participates in our in our share price growth. So um, we think that is a, a highly motivational tool and I see it every day. Um, this, this is the best group of partners I've worked at. I've been in this industry off and on because I did a few startups for about 30 years doing tours of duty in IBM, KPMG, Accenture. So I've seen it from partnership side, corporate side, um, systems integration, you name it. And I've never seen such a talented group of people working with single purpose, improving the share price and the teamwork is phenomenal. We've extended that down into the into the organization. There was a question here about pay of our people. Are we face, facing pressure? The equity model is very differentiated. We want to push the entrepreneurial story and the entrepreneurial risk story into our people. We're, the difference here is we don't pay our people less. We ask them to sacrifice salary to participate in an equity scheme. Okay, so where we tell our partners they won't get the million pounds on average, they have to start straight out of the gates with uh, almost a third. With our people, we give them the option to opt in, and that way we determine how many people have the right kind of mindset as well. We do grant them options for performance, as Caroline said, but that's how we use all of these levers to work together to drive the performance of our company and all, all linked to share price and all 100% aligned with any investor community. I think I knocked off a number of those questions there, I hope. Um, let's look at the outlook. Um, we are very bullish about our business. As Graham mentioned, I think I might have touched on it too. We had our team together last week and um, we did a bottom-up revenue build and hence we did the um, revenue upgrade that we've, we've forecast today, 85 to 90 million. Um, we still believe we're going to be in our EBITDA range. And as I think Graham mentioned, we've done three record reven revenue months um, at the start of this year. So each month was a record. And uh, that means that Q1 was a, was a record. 
And uh, we see that momentum continuing. Um, we've done 52% absolute growth in the first quarter, 19% underlying organic. Um, so we, we're very bullish about um, what's in our pipeline and what's coming down the line. I think the fact that we deliver such high quality differentiated services to our clients, because our people are so motivated to deliver for the long term. You know, the one thing I perhaps didn't mention about that sort of the two halves of the consulting market being, you know, the top 10 and, and the boutique firms, if a big brand fails publicly or screws up on a project or something like that, it doesn't really affect them. Whereas a boutique brand, if they do that, they can go out of business. So the, the focus and the emphasis on quality in the boutique world is super, super important because you can't sustain a position if you don't deliver to your clients because the big firms will just take it. No one ever got fired for hiring a big firm. right? So it's much, much harder to win work. It's much, much harder to continuously outperform them. And it therefore makes you very hungry and, and, and very um, agile. And when you've got an equity model that plays towards your success, that's why we're putting ourselves right in the middle of that debate. We're trying to push, pull as many of the, the talented individuals we see in the boutique space into a, a, a model where we can really start taking a, a real challenge to the top 10 firms um, rather than dividing and conquering through 100,000 different firms. Um, so we are market leading in growth, both organic and inorganic. We're very resilient to recession. For, perhaps I should just quickly touch on that, why we think that to be true. In growth markets, you're focusing on revenue enhancement, innovation, new products, new markets, new geographies, M&A. In contracting markets, you're focusing on operational efficiency, cost reduction, procurement, sourcing, blah, blah, blah. And if you can cover both sides of that equation, you actually find, if you look at the consulting industry over 15, 20 years, it's grown consistently on average for 15 years at 15% CAGR. The last few years, it's actually grown faster, but now more recently, it's forecast to be a little bit lower, sort of in the 8% range, as Graham mentioned, since 2017. But it's still a growing industry. And the reason it grows through recessionary periods regardless is this point, is there's cost reduction and there's also revenue enhancement or you know, there's, there's profit maximization activity, which is just as important as revenue enhancement activity. And we're fortunate enough or experienced enough to know that we've got to build capabilities on both sides of this. And hence, we see uh, the resilience in our business. I've made the point about our team are as invested as all of um, our institutional and private investors. And uh, the summary that Caroline was putting out is we, we believe we have the quality of an MBB with the agility and entrepreneurialism, let's, let's call it, of uh, the boutique consulting firms. And essentially what we're trying to do with that acquisition strategy is bring more and more of those people to the table, participating in the equity play that is 100% aligned with uh, anyone who's invested on this call and anyone who chooses to invest on this call. So um, very, very bullish. And uh, I think what I'll do is now look at some of these questions that's, and see. That's great, Stephen. Let me just jump in and just give you a, a small break between the, the Q&A. But thank you, uh, Graham, okay. Nick, Caroline, also for your uh, update and presentation this afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen, but just while Stephen and the team take a few moments to review your questions submitted already, I'd just like to remind you that a recording of today's presentation, along with a copy of the company slides and the published Q&A will be accessed via your Investor Meet company dashboard. Uh, Stephen, as you can see, you've received a number of questions from investors today, so thank you to everybody for your engagement, and I know you have touched on several of them throughout uh, your presentation, but I wondered if I may, uh, Stephen, just ask you to uh, read any out there where you feel it's appropriate to do so, and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Um, yeah, so happy to do so. Thank you. Um, uh, I have touched on quite a few of these, but I'll pick the one or two out that I think, and then ask some of my colleagues to answer in the case, if I think they're more appropriate to answer than me. Uh, the first one, amazing track record since IPO from Chris. Why does the market not value the opportunity? Good question. Um, would you consider buying stock back on any weakness? I would love to buy. Unfortunately, Graham and I are in a concert party, which means that if we make if we buy one share, we make, have to make an offer for the whole firm. I'm not ready to do that just yet, um, but I I think that uh, you know it it does present a, a very big opportunity. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so definitely from a personal point of view. From a, from a company point of view, we are um, buying through the EBT um, that we have, uh, and what that allows us to do is use those. So buying from the market 
and then using those shares as a currency for acquisitions and new partners. So that's, uh, you know, as, as the share price is low, that's obviously a good thing to do. Um, Graham, while you have the mic, can you talk a little bit about your expansion from James? Plans in the US, iLab sounds like a good deal. Where do you go from here? Yeah, so you, like I, I said earlier, um, iLab is the biggest um, acquisition that's in the US. Uh, it does uh, data uh, analytics and tech brilliantly. Um, there is plenty of space in the US to, to buy something else. So the, the US consulting market is two or three times bigger than the European market. Uh, which gives you a sense of the, the scale there. Uh, when you look at the revenues we have there now at 44% uh, of, of our global revenues, you know, it will at some point inevitably uh, tip over the 50%. And that will be a, a combination of organic and buying other, probably non-data companies. Um, but I've got several conversations ongoing. So, yes, absolutely. Um, there's a question here about how, how's the labor market for Elixir? I think we've touched on that a little bit, but maybe I should just elaborate a little bit. And what about wage inflation? Uh, essentially, if we what we look to do throughout the business, and this is a, an industry-wide thing, if we do um, increase wages, which we have done this year, then we do pass that on in, in rate hikes to our, our clients. So we look to recover that from clients. But also what I would add into that that's slightly different in our case is we do have a more entrepreneurial type of employee who is investing their own money in our shares, which we match, and also obviously the option performance option grants that they get, which create a level of stickiness. So I don't think people are as short-term in our business as they are in typical organizations. They're far more strategic about what they're trying to achieve and looking at things over a, a sort of an equity term period, which could be three to five years, let's say. So I think uh, that's quite interesting. I think I've covered some. I've covered the part to pay uh, example quite uh, specifically. Um, that, that's a question that's been asked here. Um, we'll manage with look. Yeah, I think you've touched on that, Graham. Yeah, well, that. I, I can deal with that. Okay. So, so the, the question pre-submitted: ILAP has performed better than expected. Uh, I would say as expected, um, because that's where we set it and that's what we saw. Uh, will management look for further large acquisitions despite the economy getting worse? I think I answered that, yes. Would you consider to fund this with debt, especially since that has now become expensive? Um, the answer is yes. Obviously, uh, you know we have uh, equity um, to, to, to use uh, as we see fit with what's in EBT. We've also got great cash reserves that we can give as cash or as cash for them to buy shares. Um, but, you know, I think the beauty is that we uh, combined are uh, very large shareholders of Elixir. So we will always choose whatever the right shareholder answer is. Uh, and that will be a combination of cash uh, and equity currently, and no doubt will be debt in the future, especially if we're looking for bigger and bigger acquisitions. So I think we covered, there's a question here on dilution. I think we covered that appropriately um, in in your um yeah I, yeah or shall i just just yeah. just to reinforce the point there's a yeah. question from kt will all these options dilute the overall number of shares in issue and on the dilution slide that we had in the presentation i mean the answer the answer is, is yes but only in a very limited fashion I mean, that, that project those projections show 22 percent dilution for a set of assumptions which had us growing the share price and enterprise value by fourfold so becoming a, a billion pound market cap company so the dilution will be significant, you know, is, is marginal relative to the value creation. Do you want to, there's a question here yeah. from David, what is the most common type of project that co companies highly exit for? Yes. So typically, uh, I, I probably said it earlier, it, it's what is being dis discussed at the executive level or the board level. Um, importantly, it's the strategy side of that issue. Uh, but I think what really differentiates us versus other strategy consultants, if you like, is we can actually then do the execution. And that's where we get long-term uh, trusted advisor status with our clients. Um, Katie's asked a question here, are you thinking of a US listing? As I said at the start, I think that it's inconceivable that um, we do not have a sizable US business. And if it becomes appropriate that we have a listing there, then... Um, that would be a consideration at the time. So, you know, the market in terms of consulting dollar spend is literally double the European market. So if our US business is twice as big as our European business, 
because uh, we follow the market almost precisely. Let's say that's the, the eventual outcome. It would be it would make logical sense for us to have a some form of US listing. What form that'll take, we'll, we'll wait and see. But um, it's uh, it's something we we would consider at the time. Um, as I said, our US business is growing fantastically um, and doing very very well. So I think we're out of time. We've covered most of the questions. Some of them um, I have um, covered. I think most of them have been covered. So thank you very much for your time and your your questions. It's been a, a, a great opportunity to present and talk to you. And I uh, hope, hope all of you will become, if you're not holders already, hope, hope, hopefully you will become holders soon. That's great. Stephen, Graham, Nick and Caroline, thank you very much indeed for your update and presentation and for taking your time to go through those questions. Can I please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This may take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Exilia International PLC, we'd like to thank you for your time this afternoon and for attending today's presentation. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you.